So as part of my training, I have to submit a video of myself preaching. So it's not because I want to watch myself. You know, when, um, when I was a younger man, I was, uh, you know, some of you know that we were missionaries in, in, uh, in, a, in a Muslim country in West Africa. And uh, I had this Arab friend and um, he sort of fancied himself as a bit of a miracle worker, as a kind of, uh, we call it in French West Africa, a marabou, um, an Islamic, uh, folk Islamic practitioner, someone that does magic. Um, and uh, in his bedroom, he had this locked bedroom and uh, it was very private, which was quite unusual for that culture. And once um, I went in there with him, um, he was getting something and, and by his bed, he had a portrait of himself that was right by his pillow. <laughs> so he would look at himself, but I'm not going to do that with this video. <laughs> I just want you to know. <laughs> um, so, yes, I'm going to be talking about um, the reading that Sheila gave us about David's sin. And this reading is the end part of a, of a slightly longer story. And I'm going to just recap the rest of the story. So this concerns David's adultery with Bathsheba and what happened immediately afterwards. And I say immediately because actually this story played out over many years. It, there were consequences that happened down the line. Um, so the story is that instead of going out to battle with the army, David is a bit older at this point, probably like in his late 40s or his early 50s, about my age probably. And... Instead of going out with the army, he stayed at home. And so in a way, we could call this story, the devil makes work for idle hands to do. That's a, a saying that we have. Um, but David was at home and loafing around, basically, when he should have been in the field with the army. And he goes up on the roof one day after his afternoon nap and he sees a naked woman on another roof or in, in, in a outside taking a bath so he sends a message to the woman and he summons her he gets her pregnant and she lets him know that she's pregnant and so he thinks oh what am I going to do I'm going to cover this up so he sends a message to Joab who's the commander of the army send me Uriah the Hittite I want to have a word with him so David thinks if I can get Uriah to come back to Jerusalem He'll spend the night with his wife. He'll sleep with her. So when the baby arrives, everyone will think that he's the father, as would be completely normal. But this is where the hand of God is against David because God makes it turn out other than what David is plotting. And so Uriah, very zealous for God, very zealous for the king, very zealous for Israel. And Uriah is a Hittite. He's a foreigner. He's someone who's been adopted into the family of Israel. Okay, this is another dimension to this story. He's actually someone who might have felt discriminated against. But he's zealous for Israel. He's zealous for God. And so he won't go home and sleep with his wife. Um, he sleeps outside the door of the palace on the floor. And uh, so they tell David, you know, Uriah didn't go home. So David thinks, all right. I'll try again. Next night, he invites David and gets him drunk this time. But still, Uriah is drunk, but he manages to sort of control himself. He's not completely out of his mind, and he maintains his kind of zeal. And he sleeps outside on the floor. So David gives up. He thinks, okay, I can't, I can't manipulate the situation this way. I need to go to the next level. So he sends a message to Joab and he just says, put Uriah in the most dangerous place in the battle and then withdraw from him. Leave him and let it just withdraw from him so that he's alone and surrounded. And of course this works and he's killed. So end of problem, right? Bathsheba, David summons her after she's done her appropriate mourning and she becomes his wife. But God has seen everything that happened and sends Nathan the prophet to see David. So Nathan tells him this story to rile him up. And we have to remember the thing about David is that David, from when he was a little kid, was a shepherd 
And so he has a kind of feeling about sheep. He's got sympathy with sheep and lambs. He understands them and he's emotionally engaged in this story. It, it, re it resonates with him and he gets it. He gets the emotion of this story. and he, Basically, he falls right into the trap because the whole point is that this is a trap. He falls into the trap and he pronounces judgment on the man. He says the man deserves to die and he needs to pay back four times what he stole. And why fourfold? Well, in the Old Testament law, if you stole something, you had to pay back double. But if you had sold the item, particularly if it was an animal, if it had been eaten or stolen, you had to pay four times back. And so David is applying biblical law perfectly in this situation. He understands it. He's the one that wrote, oh, how I love your law. He meditates on it night and day. He knows it inside out, except that he suspended it in this case so that he could commit adultery with a beautiful woman. So Nathan turns the tables on him and says, well, basically this is you. And he, he sort of pronounces this lament from God on David. And, and basically God says to him, look what I've done for you. And this is how you've repaid me. So God had blessed David amazingly. When David was that little kid all by himself, like also where we lived in Africa, it was mostly desert. And sometimes we'd be driving with my team and um, a, a Fulani shepherd would run out like from the bush into the path of the car with his water bottle. Like we'd meet these shepherds that run out of water and they're miles from anywhere, miles from the nearest well. So we'd give these people water sometimes. And so like, and often they're just little kids by themselves. And um, so while David was this little kid out there in the wilderness looking after the sheep, we know from another part of the Old Testament that he had killed bears and lions that had come for the sheep. So he had, David had experienced God's protection and he'd experienced God's power. And God had anointed David to be the next king and God had helped him kill Goliath. And David had married into the royal family. And when Saul turned against him and was chasing him, God had protected David. And then finally, when Saul had died, David became king of Israel and Judah. And then God, and even after all of that, God had said to David, your house will continue forever and your descendant will build the temple. So all this honour that God heaped on David. And now... God says, how could you do that to me after everything I've done for you? And like, not just committing adultery, but you've added murder to that. And now, basically, the sword is not going to depart from your house. And David, to his credit, he says straight away, I've sinned. And Nathan says, your sin's been taken away. It's already forgiven. And that is the grace of God. That's, that's the promise to us. When we, when we screw up and we confess our sin, God forgives us. That is the good news. But here's the thing. While God forgave David and took his sin away, God still punished David. Because God forgives our sin, but sometimes, you know, and one thing that evangelicals are always saying is that all sins are the same. And that is true because a, a little sin before God and a big sin it's just sin it's it's just it's the lack of perfection but there are sins that we do that have more consequences than other sins if I have an evil thought and I don't act on it I've still I've sinned but if I murder somebody I've made children fatherless or motherless you know there's other consequences so it's very serious so the thing is that actually the judgment that David pronounced on the man, that came true for him because David paid fourfold. Four of his sons died in later years. First of all, the baby died, this baby that we're talking about. And then Amnon was killed by uh, Absalom later, and then Absalom died. And then finally, Adonijah, who tried after David had died, he tried to become king in David's place when everybody, when David had said, no, Solomon is, going, Solomon is going to be the next king. And then he was killed. 
And so really, David lost four sons. He paid fourfold, exactly what he said. And I, don't, I can't understand that, but this is what happened. And we're supposed to learn from it. It is harsh. This is a harsh story. But the thing is, David should have known better. Um, the redemption in all of this is that Bathsheba's baby died, but then she had another baby, and that, and that baby was Solomon, who was the greatest of all the kings. And Solomon, in, in a way, is a picture of Jesus for us. So God still worked out good in that tragic story. So it's a gruesome story, but what can we learn from it? Well, I think there's three things that we can learn up. I think learn from this story. The first thing is that we have a human nature and it's sinful and, and we tend to try and cover up sin when we do it. Um, David tried to cover his sin and, and we have to think about what Adam and Eve did. In a way, there's a parallel between what David did here and Adam and Eve because they'd been given everything. You know, can you imagine what it was like to be Adam and Eve? And then they saw something that they weren't allowed to have that looked pretty good and they decided to take it anyway. And then their response was, oh, we're naked. Now they suddenly realised and then they tried to cover themselves. And then God had to really come and clothe them properly. God had to come and forgive them and sort it out and give them proper covering. And so in a way, just, you know, God had given everything to David. David was like Adam or Eve. David saw something that was forbidden to him that looked pretty good. I mean, she looked good enough to eat from his perspective. So he reached out and took her. But this is, you know, she was forbidden. It's another man's wife. And so David tried to cover it up, same way that Adam and Eve did. And the cover up always leads to problems multiplying. It's, and then we've all done this, when you tell one lie, to maintain it, you've got to tell another lie. And it goes on and on and on. So the result is we need to confess our sins to God and break that cycle. Um, the second thing is that with blessing comes responsibility. And one of the principles in the Bible is that the more that God gives us, the more he's going to expect of us. And actually, we do this. It's not just that God expects us to do this. So I was thinking about, you know, Dominic Cummings or Matt Hancock. Think of the outcry against their hypocrisy. And that is because we look at those guys and we think they get well paid. They've got power. They're on a telly. They get to speak and everyone listens. And then, then they just flout the rules. And there's an outcry. So it's human nature that when we have power and privilege, we, we forget who we are and we start to behave in a kind of God-like way. And so if any of us becomes rich or powerful, we have to remember that becoming rich and powerful when God allows it to happen is because he wants us to use those things to bless the world, not just so that we can sit around and enjoy ourselves David's problem was that he was bored. He should have been in the field with the army at the siege of Rabbah with the others. But at home, he, he was sitting around at home with nothing to do and saw a woman and, you know, one thing led to another. And the third thing I just want to leave us with is, I think, like, whenever I've heard this story talked about in church over the years, it's always about the sexual sin, you know, because that's what we find most shocking. But actually, I think the real issue is here is David's misusing his power. And we don't really know much about Bathsheba. But I do know one thing. I've read and I've reread this story and there's no condemnation of her in this story. She does lose the baby, but she gets another baby. Now, you know, we had a miscarriage. It's, it's a terrible thing to lose a baby. But there's no condemnation of her in this story. And it made me wonder how much choice she really had in the whole thing. Um, she might have been willing, but on the other hand, she might have been terrified. We know that some women are attracted to powerful men, but we have got no evidence that this was the case with Bathsheba, especially since David is the one that took the initiative. So it wasn't like she was trying to trap him. She, he may have raped her. We don't know. 
But the thing is about the stories is David is the one. God blamed David fully for what happened. It was his fault. So the issue in all of these things is who's in charge? Is God in charge or are we in charge? Like we, all of us make decisions every day. Some of us have more than others. Some of us have less than others. With what we have, we have to use it lawfully and we have to glorify God. We have to remember that God sees everything. And so really there's a little bit of David in all of us. We, we do find it hard to apologise to each other. We do find it difficult to admit when we're wrong. And the first, often the first instinct is to try and cover up sin when we've done wrong. And it's a temptation to think the rules don't apply to us. They apply to others, but not to me. And so I think that's something that we should be uh, just aware of. And look, but the good news is, you know, as John says in first in the first letter of John, you know, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So look, in the end of this rather horrible story, there is good news that God does forgive sin. And I think the thing is, if God lets somebody get away with their sin indefinitely, it's a sure sign that that person doesn't know God. And when the reason that God exposed David's sin is that God actually did love David and David loved God. And that is the reason why God punished David, because he wanted David to learn and understand. And where we see people in the world who get away with crime after crime after crime and nothing ever happens to them, we can be pretty certain that they're going to face a terrible judgment. And so when God punishes us, it's actually a sign that he loves us in the same way that, you know, as Craig was saying earlier about Bryony, there will come a point when, uh, you know, her mother is going to have to discipline her and teach her right from wrong. And if there's no discipline, there's no learning. So I hope that that uh, is helpful to us this morning. Any questions, anybody? Or maybe afterwards you can ask me. Thank you.